Well, here we are about to land this plane where we have been studying the names of God in this series of teaching entitled, Say My Name. The two passages of scriptures that we have been referencing and drawing from come from Exodus chapter 20, verse seven, and from Luke chapter 11 at verse two. So let's go first to Exodus 20 and seven and read it from the New King James Version of the Bible. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And now let's go over to Luke chapter 11 and verse two, where Jesus gives this model for prayer to those of us who have transferred into God's kingdom. He said to them, when you pray, say our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In this series of teaching, God has revealed to us how his name applies to the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. We have learned that we have been given his name in order to sow it in the same way that one would sow seed. And we have emphasized that the way we sow the name is by speaking the name. Now we understand that on account of the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping, when we speak the name of the Lord, we usher in the power of God to manifest the promises because God put the power in the word to make itself come to pass. This is a kingdom principle. Jesus Christ said it this way. So is the kingdom of God. It is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. So we are learning not to take the name of the Lord for granted, but instead to use the name of the Lord as a resource and as a tool to cause the blessings of God and the promises of the word of God and the will of God to manifest in our lives. We have also made the point that God's name is a form of seed that operates according to that kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. When we sow the name by speaking it and hallowing it and believing it and embracing it and holding on to it, it reproduces after its kind and we reap what the name promises. Why? Because God put the power in the name to make itself come to pass. Something we have focused on in this series about the names of God is the fact that there is a distinction between a title and a name. Whereas a person's title tells us what that person does, that person's name discloses to us who he is. Elohim and El Shaddai are two of many titles for God. Elohim is God the creator. Elohim uses words to create things. Elohim uses words to change things. But even still, Elohim is not God's name. It is one of God's titles. Likewise, we know that El Shaddai is the almighty God. El Shaddai is our source. El Shaddai is the breasted one. El Shaddai is the God who is more than enough. But as we now know, El Shaddai is not God's name. El Shaddai is one of God's titles. Now, the reason we draw attention to this distinction is that while a title is important, a title is generic. Even though your title tells us what you do, and even though your title lets us know what we can count on you for, and even though your title lets us know what you can handle, your title is still generic. Your title does not foster intimacy. Your title does not promote relationship. While your title somewhat acquaints us with you, it, it does so at an arm's length. But your name, however, is personal. Your name reveals who you are. When you give somebody your name, you are inviting them into your personal space. You are giving them access to you on a level that goes beyond that of a generic title. A name promotes intimacy. A name fosters relationship. And so the big deal is this. 
God has given us access to his name because God wants more of a relationship with us than what a title can offer. Merely knowing God by his titles limits us to a religious experience with him. You know, that's where we go to church. But when there is a problem, we feel like we have to get somebody else to pray for us. That's when we go to church, but we're not confident that God will respond to us. That's when we only communicate with God when we need him to do something. Lord, would you heal my body? And when he heals me, that's it, I'm gone. And we only come to him when we are in trouble. Lord, would you get me out of this trouble? And when he rescues us from that mess, that's it, I'm gone. That's where serving him is somewhat a chore or a got to. Got to go to church, got to pray, got to pay tithes, got to obey his word. Saints, that's religion. But Jesus did not come so that we could be limited to a religious experience. Christ came that we could have a personal relationship with him. When we talk about relationship, it is no longer got to, it is get to. We get to be God's favorite. We get to be the ones who he protects and preserves. We get to partake of his blessings and his miracles and his covenant. We get to access him and spend time with him and know him. God does not want religion from us. God wants a personal relationship with us. So let's not be too busy to spend time with God. Let's not have so much going on that we have to put God on the back burner. Let's not leave God with the impression that we don't have time for him. Let's bring God from the back of the line to the front of the line and make him our top priority. Don't settle for a religious relationship with God or religious experience with God when you can have a personal relationship with God. God says, let me introduce myself to you. I am Yahweh. And when you know Yahweh, the devil can't make you doubt how much you mean to him because you know Yahweh. And when you know him, the devil can't make you believe that God is estranged from you because you know Yahweh. And when you know him, the devil can't make you think that God is hostile towards you because you know him. Saints, we've got to know him for the scripture says that the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Come on now. You know that it's time for you to get some exploits behind you. Get some exploits under your belt. Saints, we've got to know him. He is Yahweh. And we have learned, saints, that Yahweh is a complex God. Yahweh is a God whose ways are past finding out. When Moses was chosen to lead the people out of bondage, he asked God, saying, who am I going to tell them you are? And God said in response, I am that I am. You don't have to mince words with me. Just tell them I am has sent you. You might be looking for God to act one way, but instead he acts a totally different way. You might be expecting God to go about it this way, but instead he goes about it a whole different way. You expect God to keep back the famine from the land, but instead God multiplies you 100 fold in the midst of the famine. You expect God to keep your baby away from the Pharaoh who sought to kill him, but instead he causes the Pharaoh's daughter to rescue your child and pay you to raise them for her. You wondered if God had abandoned you since you were in prison for something that you didn't even do, but instead he uses that jail experience to set you up for the greatest blessing in your life. That's why you cannot try to box him in. That's why you cannot try to get him to do it your way. That's why you cannot counsel him or instruct him or contain him. You've got to let him be Lord. He is Yahweh. And today we get to look at another dimension to the many dimensions of Yahweh. <laughs> today we get to see another facet of him. We, we've looked upon him. We found that Yahweh is multifaceted like a diamond. <laughs> but we're finding out that the more we explore him, the more Yahweh reveals about himself. <laughs> he is Yahweh sick canoe, the Lord our righteousness. <laughs> and he is Yahweh Makedish, the Lord our sanctifier. <laughs> and then again, he is Yahweh Shalom. He is the Lord our peace. <laughs> and yet he is Yahweh. Yahweh 
Shama, the Lord our fullness. At the same time, he is Yahweh Rapha, the Lord our healer, but still he is Yahweh Yira. He is the Lord our provider. And all the while, he is still Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. He has many dimensions. He has many facets. And as the multifaceted God who he is, he is constantly revealing himself and additional facets of himself to his people. And so the revelation for today will come from the 23rd number of the Psalms, which reads as follows. The Lord is my shepherd. That's Yahweh Rohi. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so today we're talking about Yahweh Rohi, the Lord, our shepherd. And the hashtag is our ride or die God. <laughs> Hallelujah. The scriptures are flooded with metaphors and similes and allegories and parables and word pictures that God uses in order to provide his people with something they can relate to. His intent is to teach us life lessons. And he uses these mechanisms to get his point across to us. For example, God says, you are the light of the world to teach us purpose. And God says, you are the salt of the earth to point out our significance. And one of my favorites that he says is this, the sower sows the word, which he uses to teach us the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. So it is very common for God to use metaphors and similes and allegories and parables and word pictures to speak to us. And a very popular metaphor or, or simile or word picture that God uses to describe his people is to compare us with sheep. In the 100th number of the Psalms at verse three, the Bible says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And over in John, the 21st chapter in verses 15 through 17, Jesus tells Peter very emphatically, if you love me, I need you to feed. I need you to tend to. I need you to take care of my sheep. So from these references, I want to address two things that stick out prominently. The first is that God clearly refers to his people as sheep. The scripture reads, we just read it. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And then the second is that God is serious about the care of his sheep. In that discourse that Jesus had with Peter, he said to him three times, Peter, if you love me, I need you to do this for me. This is important to me. I need to be able to count on you. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep, take care of my sheep. In other words, he is a ride or die kind of God. <laughs> so here and throughout the scriptures, God describes and identifies and refers to his people as sheep. So let's talk about a few observations that we can make about sheep, which may shed a little bit of light or illumination on why our ride or die God was so insistent that Peter look after them and why God makes sure that his sheep have a caretaker. A first observation that I would like to make about sheep is that they require a great deal of attention, particularly as compared to other livestock. Sheep do not have a good sense of direction. They've been known to wander. It is not uncommon for sheep to get lost. Another interesting thing about sheep 
is that sometimes they can have a hard time locating food on their own or locating water on their own. Sheep require a great deal of attention to survive the snares and traps of the enemy. And this may account for one reason that God makes sure that his sheep have a caretaker. A second observation about sheep is that they are defenseless and vulnerable. Sheep do not appear to be able to fight off their predators. You never see a sheep snarling or hissing when they sense danger. I ran across an article that's called About Sheep, which is found at www.ciwf.com, which states that sheep are prey animals and are largely defenseless against predators, naturally nervous and easily frightened. The article goes on to say they flock together for safety. So the fact that sheep are defenseless and vulnerable to the attack of the enemy would be another reason that God wants to make sure that his sheep have a caretaker. And another thing that I've learned about sheep, which is even highlighted in scripture, is that sheep are very leery of strangers, but they will follow their leader without hesitation. According to sheep101.info, sheep have a strong instinct to follow the sheep in front of them. When one sheep decides to go somewhere, the rest of the flock usually follows, even if it is not a good decision. For example, sheep will follow each other to the slaughter. If one sheep jumps over a cliff, the others are likely to follow. The fact that sheep will keep their distance from a stranger, but will follow their leader, be it the sheep that is in the front of them or be it their shepherd, would be another reason that God is so intent on making sure that his sheep have a caretaker. These observations that we can note about sheep would account for why Jesus addresses their need for a loving, protective, ride or die shepherd. In the gospel, according to John at chapter 12, the Bible says, beginning at verse one, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus notes in his explanation about the proclivities of sheep that there exists a relationship between a shepherd and his sheep in which the sheep who, although they are known as timid creatures and who, although they are hesitant and distrustful and who all they are suspecting and fearful will in spite of and contrary to their norm of behavior, we will hear the voice of their shepherd will know the voice of their shepherd and will follow their own ride or die shepherd as long as he goes before them. So now let's make some observations about a good shepherd and take a look at what it is about the ride or die God that draws in the sheep. Now for that purpose, we need to go over to the 23rd number of the Psalms, which establishes the parameters by Yahweh Rohi, the chief shepherd. Over in verse one of the 23rd number of the Psalms, the Bible gives us to know that because he is Yahweh Rohi, you shall not want. Now, that's not a commandment not to desire anything, which is how we would define it in today's vernacular. 
That word want means God will never let you be in a state of want. In other words, it means he will not allow you to lack. He will not allow you to be empty. He will not allow you to do without. He will not allow you to be deprived of. And he will not allow you to have a deficiency. Because the Lord is your shepherd. You don't have to lack. You don't have to do without. You don't have to be deprived. He will not allow you to have a deficiency. You shall shall not want. And in verse two, the Bible says, he makes me to lie down and dwell in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And so the second observation is this, because he is Yahweh Rohi, your shepherd. It is he who will always bring you to a place of rest and comfort. He will always bring you to a place of abundance and sufficiency. He will always lead you to a place of nourishment and, and he will always lead you to a place that is refreshing. He is Yahweh Rohi. He makes you lie down in green pastures and he leads you beside the still refreshing cool streams of water. And then verse three says this, he restores your soul and will lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So observation number three is this, because he is Yahweh Rohi, your shepherd, you can rest assured that he will restore your soul. <laughs> now, remember, your soul consists of your mind, your will, your emotions and your intellect. And it is your soul that serves as the battleground of the devil. See, the devil works overtime on you in order to try to get you to doubt God. The devil tries to get you in unbelief and he tries to undermine your faith. The devil tries to talk you into walking by sight and he tries to talk you out of walking by faith. But the Bible says that Yahweh Rohi, your shepherd, steps in and restores your soul that has been under attack. That means he will renew your mind. That means he teaches you how to think and he teaches you right thinking. That means he he shows you how to yield to him and how to subject your will to his will. That means he works on your thoughts so that you will be anxious for nothing. That means he does not lead you astray, but he leads you down the right path and he instructs you in the ways of righteousness and safety. He is Yahweh Rohi. He is the Lord, your shepherd. And then the Bible goes on to say in verse four, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the fourth observation is this. No matter what you go through, you can know that Yahweh Rohi is with you. And because you know that he is with you, you know that you will always be protected. You know that you will always be preserved. You know that you will always be safeguarded because there is nothing too hard for the Lord. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Because Yahweh Rohi is with you, you do not have to fear anything. Then it goes on to say, that the rod and the staff of God, that's what comforts you. Now remember, a shepherd's rod is an offensive weapon that he uses to fight off any predators that will come after the sheep. And his staff is a post that has a hook on the end of it, which the shepherd uses to guide the sheep and to keep them from wandering or straying. And as we have taught in the Bible, the rod is symbolic for the word of God and the staff represents the ministry of the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. So because he is Yahweh Rohi, you know that he's got your back. He is not going to let anything happen to you because he is Yahweh Rohi, your shepherd. He is not going to let the enemy take you out because he is Yahweh Rohi, your shepherd. Verse five says, is, uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And so this next observation is this, that after he has done all that for you, uh, he will turn around and force your enemies Hallelujah. To look on as witnesses while he causes you to feast and abound in his sufficiency. 
Hallelujah. They may not like you, but they see what great things the Lord is doing for you. They may talk about you, but they see the blessings of God all over everything you do. They may envy you, but they see you walking around in the grace of God. He prepares a table before you all up in the presence of your enemies. And then he goes on to anoint your head with oil. Now the anointing of oil in this context represents the fat of the land. That stands for abundance and blessing and bounty and divine favor and prosperity. And he pours it all over you. He smears it all over you. He heaps it all upon you until you cannot even contain it. The scripture says my cup runs over. That's talking about overflow. That's talking about abundance. That's talking about blessing. That's talking about more than enough. That's El Shaddai at work. The God who is more than enough. And then finally in verse 6, the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so because he is Yahweh Rohi, your shepherd, you get to bask in God's chesed. Now chesed is one of those Hebrew words that describes God's loving kindness. We don't even have anything in the English that would be the equivalent of chesed. David said your chesed your loving kindness, oh God, is better than life. And that's why I will praise you. And that's why I will bless you as long as I live. God's chesed accounts for all these benefits to you. God's chesed is responsible for all that grace to you. God's chesed explains the reason for all these blessings on you. God's chesed gives rise to all of this favor on you. Somebody ought to give God praise for his mercy and for his grace because it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions they fail not oh yes so you might be sitting there looking all prim and prissy today you might be sitting there looking like a touch of elegance and of class today but who are you fronting you haven't always been so together you know that it is of the Lord's mercies that you you are not consumed. And yes, you might be sitting around acting like you are all important and all that today. You might be Mr. Muckety Muck and you might be Miss Such a Much today. But who are you fronting? You know that it's on account of the Lord's mercies that you are still here today. He is Yahweh Rohi. He is the Lord our shepherd. He is Yahweh Rohi. He is the Lord who looks after you. He is Yahweh Rohi. He is the the Lord who takes care of you and because he looks out for you when it looks like you should be losing he's causing you to win and because he takes care of you when it looks like you should be hungry he causes you to eat of the good of the land why because he is Yahweh Rohi and God put the power in the word to make itself come to pass so who is Yahweh Yahweh is too intricate to wrap your mind around and who is Yahweh Yahweh. Yahweh is too deep for you to be able to keep up with. The best way to put it is that Yahweh is the I am that I am. Yahweh is whoever you need him to be. He is Yahweh Rohi. He is the Lord our shepherd. So when the devil tries to convince you that you are not going to make it, you can say not today devil for he is Yahweh Rohi and he won't allow me to be in want. And and when the devil tries to get you in fear that the predators are going to destroy you and take you out, you can say, no, no, devil, for he is Yahweh Rohi, because I've got his rod, which is his word, and his staff, the Holy Spirit, to shield me. And when the devil tries to make you feel like an outcast, or make you feel like a misfit, or make you feel like you missed an opportunity, you can say, get behind me, devil. 
devil, for he is Yahweh Rohi. He is my shepherd, and I'm basking in his goodness, and I'm basking in his grace. Jesus said, after this man of prayer, say, hallowed be your name. If we want the manifestation of what the name entails, then we've got to hallow the name. If we want the manifestation of what the name promises, then we have to hallow the name. When we hallow the name, we sow the name. And the way we sow the name is to speak the name. So we thank you, O oh God, that you are Yahweh Rohi. You are the Lord, our shepherd. And we thank you, Lord, that you are Yahweh Rohi. You are the Lord who looks after us. Thank you, God, that you'll never allow us to be in want. And we praise you, Lord, that you are a ride along God who will never allow us to go without. You are Yahweh Rohi. You are the God who regulates my mind. And you are the one who manipulates my thoughts so that they're always stayed on you. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on you, Lord Jesus. And so that I will always come out on top. Thank you for your loving kindness that has seed. For truly it is better than life itself. And I thank you for your mercy and for your grace, which are the reason that I am still standing today. You are Yahweh Rohi. You are the Lord our shepherd. You are Yahweh Rohi. You are the Lord our caretaker. And we love you today with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen.